Today I will talk about how to handle different problems in life. Because if people don't handle the problems in life, then they cannot be used by God. If you are worried every day, affected by people every day, unhappy, you cannot serve God. Even when you serve God, the result will not be good. And actually, to handle different problems is not that difficult. When you understand the theory, when you understand um, how come people behave like that? But it's a long-term habit. Because a long-term habit in life is like this. When people mistreat you, then you get angry. And many people believe in this lie. When someone mistreats me, then it's right for me to be angry. It's right for me to be emotional. It's right for me to be affected. And, and then also, when I feel unhappy, then I have the right to uh, to be out of control. Then I have the right to say negative things. So people have this kind of lies. And they didn't realize, even after people believe in Jesus, didn't realize that we are affected by this value system in our heart. That is normal, that the normal value system is that it's normal to be affected by people, it's normal to be emotional, it's normal to, uh, it's hard to get out of emotional problems. So people think like that. And that's why we behave like that. And that's why it's very hard to go a high level. But if you learn the source of all these problems and learn how not to be affected by them, then you actually, you can gradually learn to overcome step by step. And it started with me, it started like this. When I experienced the Holy Spirit in 1998, my eyes were totally open. I said, I didn't know God is so strong, can be so strong on us, so powerful that He can change our life and bless our life directly like that. And then the evangelist can carry so much power. At that time, he might be praying for, I don't know how many people, maybe two or three thousand people. And he is very anointed. And he kept praying for people very quickly. And people experienced the Holy Spirit very quickly. And, and I saw that, I said, I really want to have that close relationship. And I want to carry the power of God like that. And so I dedicate my life to God and I spend a lot of time praying. And then when I start to notice, I can experience joy later. I, I was really excited. And I kept the joy of the Lord every day, from morning to night. I would kept stay. I would stay in the joy of the Lord. I would rejoice all the time. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Now, some of you have experienced that. I hope you will say yes. I want to stay in the joy of the Lord. And then one day, that you have heard me talk about this, but the incident triggered my change. I called someone to share about my experience. To me, it's so life changing. And I shared with that person on the phone, and, but she was angry because she could, did not accept the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And then she was angry and I hang up the phone, I was affected. And when I pray again, I lost the joy because I was burdened. And then I said, this is not right. God moves in my heart to say this is not right. I have to handle it. And then I said, what can I do? Then I call her up and say, if I made you unhappy, I'm sorry. But she still did not accept it. And then she was still angry. And I, when I hang up the phone, I said, I already did my part. And I let go. And I just let go and then relax my mind and, and just praise the Lord. And the joy came back again. And then God told me, from now on, you take care of different problems like that. It's just one time teaching. If you remember this incident that I have, you apply to all your life uh, problems, then you can handle it. But in the process, God has taught me how to do it. Actually, basically, I, let me tell you where my teachings came from. My teachings came from how God handled my problems inside. I noticed how God spoke to me, guided me, and then I handled it. And then I noticed the steps, and noticed my resistance, and then noticed how I changed. And then I broke, broke down the process. And then sometimes I analyze and write down points and share with people. And then when people uh, 
heard that. They said, this is practical and simple and applicable. And then they found that they can do it. So it's basically, it's from something that worked in me. And actually, it worked many times because for a long time, I had to handle this. After I experienced the Holy Spirit in 1998, I probably went into a mission field in 1999, and, and there I found that the power of the Holy Spirit was very strong when I led the meeting. Because I, I tried to, you know, first I lay hand on many people in my church and I lay hand on some people in other churches, uh, and then I went into a mission field. Someone invited me to go one time. And then I remember how uh, some of the revival meetings are and how the leader excited people to hunger for the Lord, to think of the Lord blessing us and reach our heart to God. And so I did that. And when I did that, the people experienced the Holy Spirit. I already found that, that I, when I led the Spirit field meetings, many people experienced the Holy Spirit. But God had me, you know, that uh, because my first wife couldn't adjust to Hong Kong. I had to return and stay in America for a number of years. In those years, I had to handle many problems in life. And after I, you know, finished the process, and then, you know, and then I had the chance to come back to Hong Kong. And then I started to develop the teaching. Already had it in my mind to want to handle the problem. And I started to organize it and write the teachings. And then I, I taught it to many people and they found it very practical, helpful, because I have applied for years, for years, when people said negative things to me. And some people would, you know, would be totally torn down and disappointed. But I said, I insist, God has a plan in my life. God wants to do something great in my life, and God wants to use everybody to a great extent. So I said, I don't want to waste that life, especially when I see how, when I pray for people, so many people experience the Holy Spirit, I said, I don't want to waste it. Actually, after I experience the Holy Spirit, no one tutors me. No one mentors me to say, you, uh, you know, practice praying for people and build up your anointing and then pray for people to lead the people to Christ. Actually, I never heard people lead people to Christ like that. It was me who mentors myself to say, if I have the power of the Holy Spirit, how can I use it? And then I kept praying for people that came into the church and then to, uh, when I went to other meetings, and then I found that God continued to use me. And then I, you know, uh, people, t uh, God uh, talked to me in different ways. For instance, I saw in some meetings, people experience great deliverance. They cry for a long time. And uh, like, it looks like the sadness has come out. All the hearts has come out. But then I saw them two or three years later, and the same person was still wailing. Whoa, <laughs> People pray for them. And I said, this is not right. How come two or three years later, the same thing happened? And they look for that experience continually. I said, it's not just spiritual experience. It has to be a daily life handling of problem. So it's not just the spirit, but also the soul and the daily life. So the spirit is, you know, when they experience the Holy Spirit, that's the spirit. And then uh, also the soul, the soul inclu includes remember, the mind, the will, the feelings, to handle all this and the daily life, how to live the daily life. And then I notice how I handle it and then I'm not affected by, by different people. And some people always talk about attacks. They said, now if you don't do this, don't do that, you'll be attacked when you go to the mission field, when you drive out demons. And I found that when I handle problems in life and have a close relationship with God, I haven't noticed any attacks on me. So I don't believe in people saying, oh, when you drive out demons, the sin will attack you and your family. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say that. It doesn't say that when you follow God's will and then Satan will attack you. But the Bible does say if you sin, you give in to the devil, then he will attack you. He will steal, kill, and destroy. But that's when you sin. So I noticed that attack doesn't come from evangelism or serving God. 
it came from sins. But when you handle the problem and live in you know, a close relationship with God, and then the sins will have no destroying power on you. And then you can be free. And I look for this, to live in joy for the whole day long. And God spoke to me one time through listening to the Bible. I listen to the Bible all the time. In Matthew 25, it talks about Jesus said to the one who had five talents and earned five talents. And then Jesus said, the master said to him, good and faithful servant, you have been faithful in a few things. And then I said, how come a few things? This person has earned five talents. It's the most faithful one. But then I realized that because many people, you know, when I noticed my life, because for the whole day, sometimes we don't think of God. And we might not be glorifying God, we don't have that thought. Many people live in daily life, never think of how we can affect people. When I have contact with people, I always think of how to influence them. When I have the presence of God all the time. So, starting that time, I really pay attention to stay in the joy of the Lord and stay in the thought of God. Always think about blessing people. So that's how God mentors me. And I start to live in joy, live in peace all the time and live in love to, to uh, help people. And then in the process, even though I face different kind of persecution, I still follow God and be faithful. And here I want to uh, explain how the first thing we want to overcome is how not to be affected by people. This is the number one killer, the number one killer of many Christians that the family members, husband or wife, children, or co-workers, or even sometimes people in the church, or even sometimes ministers have hurt. Let me tell you, I'm a pastor. I have related to, to a number of pastors. I noticed that everyone, including myself, have problems. Everyone has problems. If you look for a perfect minister, there's no no one like that. There is no perfect minister. And so when people expect them to be, to be really good, that you will notice that sometimes you'll be disappointed. Now, I'm not saying ministers are not good. Ministers actually have dedicated their life to God. They have really tried their best. But they will sometimes fail in some areas. If you find faults, or if you just come across the time when they are busy, and emotional and burdened and then you might hear something negative from them and what I'm saying is don't be bothered by that it's normal for some people to show some emotions now although although for me I try to handle it immediately and people who stay with me notice that I'm always positive people have not found me to be negative that I'm always say things positive. Whatever problems come up, I always say things positively. Okay. Here I will pull you some Bible verses that talk about how we should not be affected by people. Psalm 118 verse 6. You can write this down and then look it up at home. Psalm 118 verse 6. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? So the word is with me. I will not be afraid. What can people do to me? They will die. What can they do to me? They cannot destroy God's plan. So that's very important. Now why are people affected by people? Because of the lack of security, the sense of security. When people say you fall, very often we get angry because we say, I'm not a fool. I'm not that bad. And then when people say that, we get angry. We want to defend. Because we don't have a strong sense of security in Jesus. When we have a strong sense of security, when people say negative things to me, you know, I don't have to take it. If I have the problem, I will correct. If someone tells me I'm wrong, now, very often people's sense of insecurity will be ticked off. When people say, uh, you know, sometimes people say, uh, can you do this? Can you improve on this? Can you do it better? And then we get angry. 
Because we don't like it. We feel unhappy. Most people, if someone tells you, there is something you need to improve, do you take it happily? Thank you for telling me that I can improve. Do we take it happily? Most people don't. Why? Because of the insecurity in our heart. That we have this sense of insecurity. That when people say that, you are no good, you're not doing well, you need to improve. And then we get angry. We say, it's not like that. We want to defend. We want to defend ourselves and say, it's not like that. You misunderstood me. Because we have a we lack the sense of security. But if we say, even for now, you know, I have ministered to many people, I have helped many people spiritually, and I have preached, and many people like my preaching. But still, my wife will sometimes suggest to me. But my wife, when she talks to me, 99% of the time is words of love. It's only once in a while she gave me some suggestion. When she said that to me, I can say, Everybody likes my preaching. Why do you tell, say I can improve? I can get angry like that if I have a sense of insecurity. But I say, when my, when my wife can tell me how to improve, that is, she is wise because many people cannot tell me. They cannot pinpoint where I can improve. So if my wife can suggest that, I will thank her. Even though my heart's reaction is not first, my reaction is, I'm not happy to hear that. My first reaction. But immediately I noticed that I feel a little unhappy and I said I should be happy for that. So I told myself, accept it with grace and thank her. So I ch chose to thank her. And my wife is very wise. She will wait until the thing is over and she will talk to me calmly, peacefully, so that I will not be offended. And, but at the same time, I have a sense of security. I feel secure inside. The only way I can improve if, is if I can take uh, suggestions, right? When I can take suggestions, then I can improve. If I cannot take suggestions, I cannot improve. So I, the sense of security inside is very important. Every time when someone says negative to you, it's our sense of security that's affected. We feel offended. Someone doesn't like me. Someone sees a fault in me, and I don't like that. And that's why we get angry. When you realize that, then you say, should I be affected by people, or should I follow God's way so I can improve and improve? The only way you can keep improving is when we accept suggestions. And even when people suggest in an impolite way, we can choose to accept it gracefully and say, it's okay, if he's impolite, it's okay. When he's rough, it's okay. That uh, even if he suggests it in a very impolite way, it's his problem. But his suggestion is good, and then I will accept it. Can you understand this mentality? What can they do to me? They will not kill me, they will not destroy me. Only my sins can destroy me, so then I choose not to be affected. And then I'll tell you how not to be affected. But I, first I'll tell you the Bible verses. And the second verse, Romans 8, 31. If God is for me, who can be against us? If God is for me, for us. If God helps us, what can do, what can people do to be against us? What can people do to destroy God's plan? Now, of course, sometimes we have to defend ourselves. But... What this verse is saying, do not be afraid of them. They cannot destroy God's plan. And God gave me this thought. God gave me thoughts all the time. God gave me this thought. One day when you go to heaven, God will not say to you, sorry, sorry. When that person attacked you, I did not help you. So you, you could not uh, do the best of your life. So you wasted your life. It's my fault. Did God have to apologize to you like that? God did not have to apologize to you like that. God will show you. See how it helped you. Each one of us, when we go to heaven, we'll see. This person, he is in sins and he's hurting us, but we are affected by them. And then our life doesn't you know, go to the level of God's plan. 
And that is because of our sense of insecurity. And then, when you see that how you overcome that, and then God will say, you are a good and faithful servant. And God will show us, in all these difficulties, on all these attacks, I have the plan to help you. And right now, God has a plan to help you through my teaching. God has helped me first, and then I come to help you. And then I hope you put this teaching into your heart. Actually, every teaching of mine is very important. I'm not saying I'm important. I'm saying those are important teachings God has taught me. And I want to pass it to you that God has taught me to handle these problems. And I find it is very important because I handle all different kinds of problems from people and from myself. Therefore, I can stay peaceful. Therefore, I can stay totally relaxed, totally free. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! In my heart, there is nothing blocking me. Let me tell you, in the past, some feelings have blocked my heart. But I handle it. Every time I pray, I will relax my heart and say, I don't have to worry about anything. Even ministry. Sometimes you say, oh, would the ministry have problem? But actually, the thought came to me. God has a plan. Not only in people, in the church, in ministry too. God has a plan. In ministries, God cares about the ministry more than we do. Can you believe that? God cares about our ministry more than we do. So when He cares about that, He will have a wonderful plan. We don't have to worry about it. We just do our part. When we do our part, God for sure will help us and bless us, and then the ministry will go up. So when we follow God, everything will be better and better. And so God said, don't worry about ministry. Don't worry about the results. Just do your best how to improve your life with God and handle problems from people. Then you will not be affected by people. And the ministry can go stronger and stronger. And God opens the way. Like a few days ago, a bishop came to me and came to me and said, if you want to do more training here, uh, you should rent a place in a city hall or somewhere, city center, and then rent a place and then so that people can go to a, a neutral place, not to a church. And then today I went to the principal and the principal said, I have a place. <laughs> and, then, and then I can use that place. And that place can seat 80 people. And I said, that's what God provided. So when there's a need, God will provide. When you follow God, things will happen. Like at first, I was told that I should go to the school on Tuesday and Wednesday. But on Tuesday, when the teachers experience the Holy Spirit and the principal experience the Holy Spirit, and then she said to me, please come every day. <laughs> and also, not just pray for the teachers. And at first she said, she gives me 20 minutes. Now she gives me almost a whole hour <laughs> until eight o'clock. And then, and then she's, so she keep expanding the number of hours and the number of days. And then she also told me to go to pray for the students. So that's how God opened the way. Because God has a plan already. Nobody can destroy. If we have a good relationship with God and handle our problems, things will go better and better and better when you have the heart. And your life will go better and better. So when you have job problem, people problem, personal problem, family problem, emotional problem, no problem. If you just handle it step by step. I'll talk about how to handle it. Okay? And then Genesis 50, 20. Genesis 50, verse 20. That Joseph said to his brothers, You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. His brothers were jealous, were jealous and wanted to kill him. And then finally they sold him to Egypt. But they intended to hurt him. But God's intention, he used this. Now first of all, God did not make the brothers become jealous of him. It's not God's work. It's Satan's work. It's sin's work, sinful nature's work to make his brothers jealous. And then wanted to kill him or, uh, or to sell him. But then God has a plan. God used people's folly. People sin to accomplish His will, and then 
God works in his life. God arranged that he go to the master, Potiphar, and this master saw the good works of Joseph, and he let him be the, uh, the steward uh, uh, of the house, and then raised up his life. And then later, the mistress uh, uh, lured him, tempted him to commit adultery, but he did not give in. And then he was put in prison. It looks like he was again hurt by the mistress. But then, when he went there, he had the chance finally to affect Pharaoh. And finally, he got a place in the palace of Pharaoh. So this is the plan of God. So the plan of God supersedes people's plans. So when you follow God's plan, the best will happen to you. Do you want to be like Joseph? Joseph is one example of a person hurt by other people, and yet he did not take it. Actually, when he was taken to Egypt, imagine, he did not know the language of the Egyptians. But immediately, he was doing well. And then he was learning the language fast. And he was doing his job well. Then his master noticed that. So that's because of the presence of God. That, can talk, that God can taught him many things. And I thank God, I, I say this not to boast. I say this to glorify God. When I have the heart to love God, God has taught me so many things. For instance, when I went to the seminary, all the students there were native English speakers. But when I had the examination, every student has to have an English examination. And my grade was the number one. And they told me, you are Chinese, but your English grade is the number one, superseding the native English speakers. And, and also, God taught me theology, taught me the analytical mind, and then later taught me experience the Holy Spirit and how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. God told me, I've seen many evangelists, they, you know, they pray with power, but they did not tell people how to do it. But God gave me the heart to teach people how to do it. So God spoke to me, and then I tell people how God taught me, and I pass it on to you. And I chose not to be affected by people. And everything I learned, I tried to be, try to do it as, as well as I can, to do it in the best way, so that I can bless people. In every way, like singing or leading worship, or praying for people, or preaching, or the freedom in ministry, and handling problems. And God has taught me. And what I want to say is, God will help you too. When you follow God, God will help you. God will raise up your life if you are willing to follow God's plan and not to be affected by people. Okay, in other words, that we need to understand to overcome the problems of people is Romans 3.23. That you probably know this verse very well. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Why do people have problems with people? Because we expect them to be better. We don't expect to find faults. When we find any problem with anyone, we cannot accept it. Because we think, a husband should be nicer than that. My wife should be nicer than that. The people around me should be nicer than that. But the fact is, people have sins and problems. Basically, let me tell you, most of the people are selfish and self-centered. It's a fact of life. Let me ask yourself, do you think about people first or think about yourself first? Do you think about blessing people first or think about your own needs first? Most people basically just think about our own needs. Think about our own problems and are overwhelmed by our problems and, and the things we need to face and then we try to get benefit from different sources. When people don't get that, then people get angry. When people are offended, then they get angry. When their self-image got offended, then they get angry. Basically, it's because people sin. Can you accept it? Now, if we, when we believe in Jesus, and then immediately when we take him to heaven, there's no problem of Christian life. Nobody will have any problem, right? Because everyone around you is perfect and you are perfect. That's no problem. The problem is we are living among sinners. 
and we are a sinner. And that's why in our daily life, we face so many problems because we see the closer we are to some people, the more problems we see. Have you noticed that? When people date each other, they say, wow, this is the perfect mate. But when people get married, they start to notice the problems. And then they get angry. And then, and then when they get angry, and they yell at each other, and it hurts the relationship. It's not just people's sin, it's our sin too. I use an illustration. If this represents someone who talks to you, when people talk, they have two messages. Now write this down, it's very important. One message is the spoken message. One message is the emotional message. It's, one is the spoken message, and the other one is the emotional message. Like someone says to you, hurry up! Can you, can you feel the emotional message? The emotional message is the person is impatient with you. He's unhappy with you. So when he talks, he talks impatiently. That impatience, you pick up. Let me ask you, are you affected by what he said more or by his feelings? What affected you more? Feelings. We are affected by feelings more. And when we are affected by feelings, what comes up from our heart? Our feelings too. And then for us, when we hear messages from people, we also have two responses. One response is the response to the spoken message. And the other response is the response of our own emotions. Now even when people talk peacefully, we might get emotional. i use an example. If someone says, um, can we improve the praise and worship team? And then if you are one of the worship team members, you say, does it mean that he doesn't like my praise and worship? Does it mean I'm not doing well? Does it mean he's criticizing me all the time? All kinds of thoughts come up, right? Or that your husband says to you, uh, please wash the dishes. He says it very peacefully. But you say, you can say a number of things. Why didn't he wash it? Secondly, he says, he told me to wash the dishes. Does it mean she, he's unhappy? So we have all these responses. Where people, sometimes when they are nice to us, for instance, someone says to you, oh, this time you're doing very well. And then you say, does it mean last time I didn't do so well? Do you have feelings like that come up? That people like to think and think, does it mean he doesn't like me? Because we have a sense of insecurity. Many problems is caused by our sense of security. So when people talk peacefully to us, we still might have insecurity coming up and we are affected. And then our response, so if he says, please do it faster, and then the, if the response to the spoken message is, yes, then I will hurry up and finish it. But then the emotional response is like, he told me to hurry up. I really try my best. Mm, I don't like him talking to me like that. Oh, it's hard to take that man. How can I work with him? Right? <laughs> so we have this, all these emotional responses. The problem is we did not realize it. We did not pay attention to ourselves. Now, why did I learn to pay attention to myself? It, it's because when I praise the Lord all the time and stay in the love of God all the time, I notice when I lose the joy. I notice when I feel burdened. I notice when I worry. I notice that and immediately I take care of it. I did not search my heart and say what, what negative emotions I have. I just stay in the love of God. Now, sometimes God guides me to to examine myself too. Sometimes when I wash dishes, I wash dishes, suddenly I think of a time in the past how I related to a certain person. Sometimes I really feel sorry for what I did to some people, for what I said to some people. And God guided me to say, okay, be sorry and repent and ask God to forgive and then from now on, change. That's the positive way. But some people, it's not like that. When they think of past events, they say, oh, that person is not nice to me. Oh, it's so painful to relate to the person. 
or the thing, oh, I always fail. I always cannot relate to people. So we have this kinds of negative thinking. When you think about things in the past, do you sometimes feel negative? Do you sometimes feel sad, unhappy because of the past, the things in the past? When we think about the about, about past, do you recycle the garbage or recycle God's promise? Let me ask you. Do you recycle the garbage and say, oh, I didn't do so well, or oh, that person is not nice to me? Or do you recycle the word of God? Oh, God has a wonderful plan. I failed that time, but it's okay that I can improve. And in many times when I wash dishes or do daily chores, God talked to me and let me think about past things. And I started to feel sorry for the people I hurt. When I said something negative to them, I felt sorry. And I said, from now on, I don't want to say anything negative to anyone. I felt sorry for my sins in the past. And then I want to, you know, to overcome my sins. So that's how God spoke to me. To take care of my different problems. I found that when I am in peace, God spoke to me all the time. When anything happened, when I have any responses, God will speak to me. And when I want to look for teachings, God spoke to me. And I thank God for that. And so when I accept people are sinners, I find them. I can accept them being sinners and I can sympathize with them. I can have compassion with them and understand these people have been hurt by people many times. That's why they hurt us. And then I can say, I don't have to be hurt by them. Okay? Now, and then in Psalm 146, verse 3, do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. And sometimes because we rely on our husband or wife or our parents or our children or other Christians or our ministers, when we rely on them, and then sometimes we are disappointed because we have expectation. Many parents have the expectation that children will be better. The children will do well in school and find a good job. But then when they cannot do well, and then we are frustrated. We don't study. What will happen to you? You'll become a beggar. You'll be no good. So we get frustrated. We have expectation. Okay? Now, after I talk about these verses, how can we handle the negative inputs from other people? It's very simple. The bad input, don't take. Good input, you take. Garbage, don't eat. Good things from God, we eat it. That's simple. Do you want to eat garbage? Do you like garbage? We're not flies huh? or roaches, right? The flies and roaches like garbage. We don't like garbage. Garbage is not good. But many people feed on garbage every day. All day long. My husband treats me like this. Oh, people treat me like this. Life is unfair. Life is difficult. And they recycle it over and over. When someone says something negative to them, they recycle it at least a few hundred times. When you recycle some negative words a few hundred times, what will happen to your mind? It's all garbage. It's all negative. That's why people, many people are negative. And I want to tell you this. In a choice of, of spouses, if some of you are not married or, or you are counseling a, uh, a married person, when you talk about marriage, you tell them. The most important thing is seek God's will. The person must be a Christian. But you also pay attention to how much garbage this person has. Some people basically are filled with garbage. You stay with them, you will always Hear garbage, and you always suffer. Have you, have you known people like that? And you date them, and you think that's the treasure of your life. And you did notice. Let me quote you one example. One time on the street, I saw a girl leaning against a guy, and a guy was calling his home. You know, I, from the tall voice, from what he said, I know that. I was just passing by, and he said something like this, I won't go home tonight. Uh, uh, why do you ask me where to go? Things like this. Very negative. Very angry. 
But the girl just leaned against him, enjoying him, and thinking that, wow, my boyfriend likes me more than his family. But let me tell you, after they get married, this man will start to yell at the wife like that. The same way that he yelled at his family member. The same way. Because from his mouth is all garbage. His heart is full of garbage. So we, the first thing we need to learn is to discern. Discern what kind of people they are. We have to discern. Now when we discern, it doesn't mean we judge and say, Hence, he has no hope. But we say, Lord, help me to have compassion and love them and pray for them and help them. It doesn't mean we, we don't want them, but we understand how they are and then we're not affected by them. That's the key. So do not take garbage. I use a simple illustration. Have you seen crazy people? Have you seen crazy people? When crazy people talk, do you listen? You don't want to listen, right? When crazy people talk, they and you know I've seen crazy people walk on the street and whoever they see they will yell at people one time I faced it myself I walked across the street there was one man walking toward me and he did not know me and he just looked at me and, ah, ah, ah. I said what's wrong <laughs> and then we know that there must be something wrong with this person and then we will put it down right yeah. would you think about crazy people's words for a month no, you will put it down in a short time because you know that he is crazy. But let me ask you, do you know that people are sinners? Do you know people are sinners? Can we accept that sinners are similar to crazy people? They're not the same. I mean, they seem normal. They can cook, they can eat, they can work, they can talk, they can do normal things. But, from the mouth came negative words. And even, actually, even most, many Christians, when they talk, they don't think about the feelings of people. That's something many people don't think about. When, when we say, give suggestions, many people say it in a negative way. Remember I talked about this, words of grace, not only from God, also from people. This is very important for you to distinguish. Words of grace of people is like this. God loves you. I care about you. You are precious. You are important. God can do great things in your life. I want to help you. And we should say things like this to each other and to your children and to your spouse. Okay? This, these are words of grace. And then words of the law. We need to say words of the law too. You have to say to your children, okay? You have to pick up the dishes and you have to wash them. You have to tell them what to do. And let's pray to the Lord. This is word of the law. And even when I leave worship, I say, let's stand up. Open a heart and hunger for God. That's word of instruction. Instructions are commandments or, or the law to what to do. The point is, this are positive, telling people what to do. Or say, let's do it. The best way to say, let's do it. Say it together. Let's do it. Let's worship the Lord. Say it. Let's worship the Lord. Let's pray together. Or I'll pray for you. So these are you know, words that people feel comfortable. But then the law can be used in a negative way. If the law is used in a negative way, it hurts to your heart. When people say, you have no love. You don't love people. You haven't done it. It hurts, right? And then the worst is labeling. You always sin. You are no good. You have no hope. Those are labeling. So, words of the law can be very, very destructive. We have to understand the use of the law of God. First is guidance. The best is guidance. How can you improve? What can you do? This, in counseling, you use this, write this down. In counseling, you can say, what can you do to overcome this problem? So you guide the person to think, what can you do? What can we do to overcome this problem? Guiding. To let the person think about what to do. And then if the person doesn't know what to do, we can instruct. We can say, well, you can do this to your husband. You can do this to your wife. You don't have to take this word seriously. So this is instruction. But avoid negative comments of the law saying you did not do it. Instead of that, 
For instance, when someone prays and did not experience the Holy Spirit, don't say, you haven't opened your heart. You don't have to say that. You just say, let's open the heart. Hunger for God more. That's better, right? Every time we say, you did not open your heart, it leaves a hurt in the heart of the person. We don't have to say it. When your children did not obey you, you can just say, okay, what can you do? What can you do better? And then you can also even set penalties, okay? Now, uh, when you do, do not do it, then you'll be punished. So what can you do? So approach it in a positive way. Instead of always saying, you didn't do it, you didn't do it. Every time I told you you didn't do it, it will leave a hurt in the heart of your children. So try to say positive words and avoid negative way of saying it. When you say it, now actually, in all this teaching, I have shown you the love of God, but I also show you many things we should do, right? But do you feel condemned by me? Did I condemn you? I did not condemn you. My words is all gentle and guiding you, leading you to understand the nature of sin, the nature of problems, and how to handle it. And I did not condemn you, even though I know that most, many of you are not able to handle the problems well. But I don't have to tell you that. And I don't have to make you feel bad, even though I know that. I would not make people feel bad. Or when people come for, for counseling, I did not have to tell them that how foolish they were when they made some action in the past. I don't have to tell them. It already happened. We don't have to tell them anymore. So, okay. The words of grace and also how to use the law. Do you understand this part? This is very important. So pay attention to your words. I use simple illustration. Like in the worship team. People can say this. Next time you better come on time. <laughs> now it could be very true that the person did not come on time. But the way we say it could make the person feel hurt. But we can say, uh, what happened today? Uh, 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 what held you back? And what can we help you? And is there something I can pray for you? So we're still finding the solution. We're finding a solution, but in a way, we don't have to hurt people. That's very key. Or in evangelism, sometimes people, when, when they do evangelism, when the people believe, then they're very happy. But when people don't believe, and then they will say something, you go to hell. You, you'll be punished by God. And you'll have bad consequences. When people don't believe, or sometimes we don't say it. But we start not to pay attention to that person, because that person rejected the gospel. You know, that hurts people. And it gives a bad testimony to people that when Christians are rejected, then they get angry. The anger will show. So I hope that you notice that. And then when people talk to you negatively, you notice that they are talking negative, negatively. So you know how people talk. So you notice that people are talking negatively and then we don't take it seriously. So just now I said, crazy people with we don't have to take seriously. Serious words, we don't have to take seriously. And we analyze, why am I affect, affected? This is very important, analyze. Why am I affected? When he said, you can do better next time, why am I affected? Because we feel offended. We feel he despises me. Therefore, I feel angry. So we analyze ourselves, how insecure we are. Most people in, are insecure. When we have insecurity, we have two directions. Some people try to be proud and show I'm better than you. I do everything better than you. But actually when people always have to tell you, I did this, I did that, I did all these things, I have tried my best, is to hope that you will praise him and say you are doing very well. Because he has a, he lacks the sense of security. And another approach is saying, oh I'm no good, I can never do it. So it's false humility. It's fear. I cannot do it. So people have all this kind of reaction without knowing it. Without knowing it. Have you noticed that? Many of our responses to life, we responded without knowing it. We have been responding with negative responses for a whole lifetime and without realizing it. We have been affected by people's words without realizing it. Okay, then how do we handle? 
Five steps to victory. God has shown me. Five steps to a victory. That you already heard. Aware. Remember? Yes. Aware. I'm aware. I'm affected by the person. Second, destructive. If I'm affected by a person, it's destructive to me. Three, apply biblical principle. Biblical principle is what can men do to me? Who can be against me? So they cannot do anything to hurt me. And biblical principle is I have compassion on them and forgive them and bless them. And be nice to them. And from the good man, you know what? The goodness in the heart will come out good words. When people have goodness in the heart, when you have peace in the heart, every word from your mouth will be always positive. So uh, apply with biblical principle. Four, pray. And five, choose not to be affected. In the process, apply biblical principle, we have to analyze ourselves. Why am I affected? Does it sound simple? It's quite simple. But many people just never learn it. Because our heart is too caught, caught up with different problems. Because our heart is not clear. Therefore, we cannot hear God's voice to handle the problems. Because our heart has all these problems making us unable to handle the problems. And we think that to be angry with the person is right. Many people say, you treat me like that. It's right for me to be angry with the person. And did not realize that this is destructive. So then we handle it. It's very simple, right? The five steps to victory. Can you say it again? First, aware. Second, destructive. Third, a biblical principle. Four, pray. Five, choose to obey. Now, that's how we can not, we learn not to be affected. And then, what can we do toward the person? We have compassion. Because that person is miserable, he has been hurt by many people, and one day in front of God, he will be judged for what he said to us. The Bible says that those people who hurt us, hurt Christ. And Christ one day will bring that to judgment. So that person is more miserable. Therefore, I want to have compassion on the person and pray for them. Let me tell you, when I experienced the Holy Spirit, I was in the traditional church. And someone in the traditional church persecuted me severely. He wanted to make sure that I would leave the church. And he did everything he could. And finally, I did leave. And then when I thought about the person, sometimes I said, uh, at first, I said, how would God punish him? Her, actually, he said her. How would God punish her? Uh, and then one time a thought came to me, maybe he'll get cancer. And then I said, that's not right. It's not right. <laughs> and I said, it's not right to think like that. And I want to pray for the person that she will be faithful to God in her way. Not in my way. That she will be faithful to the Lord in her way. And one day in a judgment seat, God will say to her, you are a good and faithful servant. So God changed my heart. I want to pray for her that the good things will happen to her. That way, in my heart is good things. Instead of hurts from the past, that affects me. So God taught me and changed my heart. And then I listen. And then I follow God. And then I start to take care of every problem like that. And then I learn when people talk to me negatively. I can look at a person and say, why did you talk to me like that? And then I will not be affected. I will listen to the person and then respond positively. At the same time, I'll be praying. Uh, praying for the person and also asking God uh, about the situation of this person and how can I handle it. Okay, so this is treating ourselves and treating the person nicely and forgive. Then there is the next step. So there are three parts. First part is take care of our heart. So we're not affected. First part, take care of our heart. Second part, take care of our attitude toward the person. The third part, how to help this person. Because the first part, then we're not affected, then we can stay peaceful. And the second part is that we have no anger toward the person that we can forgive and bless. And then the third part, how to handle it. This is different for each person. Let me tell you. 
Few people are open to suggestions. Very few people are open to suggestions to change. So we have to learn to accept this. And we have to discern the person. That's, is the person ready for suggestions? If the person is not ready for suggestion, it's better not to suggest. We have to find ways how to help the person. Sometimes, you love him more by changing. Use an example of your husband, wife. You suggest to him to change. He will yell at you more, right? Have you tried that? It doesn't work, right? But when you're nicer to them, someday you might change. So a better way to change people is to overcome wickedness with goodness. Overcome wickedness with goodness. You treat him nicely, one day he might change. And we have to discern people. There are people who just don't change at all. There are people who change once in a while. But even people who change once in a while will realize that they don't change easily. That most people cannot accept uh, suggestions. And we also should learn to find the right moment to say the things. Let me use an illustration. I knew someone on the internet, and this person helped me greatly. What did he help me? He connected me with some places. Because of him, I have gone to at least two groups of people, three, actually three groups of people, because of his introduction. But when I call him up and I ask him, when I come to your, when I fly to your place, how do I take the, you know, take the, uh, a bus to the train station and how to go to your place and when I get off the uh, airport do I cross the street or stay on my side and take the bus he told me you take number this number this bus and then I said is the bus on my side or the other side and then he was angry and he's why do you ask all these questions he just wrote you know why do you ask all this question okay now, I know something was wrong, but I just answer him peacefully, okay? I'll be carrying my luggage. If I have to walk across the street and then find out I have to come back, I have to ask a bus, wait for a bus to come, and then I ask, okay, does this go to the train station? They say no, and then I have to come back, because the bus has two directions, right? So I said, if I ask you ahead of time, I can avoid that. So he, then he answered me. I don't know. <laughs> so he didn't know. He could have said, I don't know. You, you have to find your way. Then it's okay for me. Okay? But then I, I realized he has a problem. And then I went to the place. And then I, I taught in a few days. And when I left, he took me to the bus station. And then we ate together. And when we ate, he talked to me. He said, Pastor Yu, when I heard you start preaching, I have a total new image of you. I thank God for that. That I saw that you so, you are so able to affect the people when you spoke. And I said, thank God for that. And, and you too, you can be used by God. And then I said, do you want to be used by God? And he said, yes. And I said, can I ask you something? And then he said, okay. I said, on the day when I asked you how to come, how come when I asked you, you got angry? I noticed, that's what I said, did you notice you were angry? I said this, did you notice you were angry? He said, yes. And I said, do you know why you were angry? He said, because I don't like people ask me details. When people ask me details, I got angry. Okay, and I said, well, but in life, there are many people who ask you details. So you get angry, how can you, serve God and serve people, you know, serve people because he wants to get into the ministry. I said, that's something you have to handle. So, and then I talked to him about how to handle, you know, uh, negative emotions and, and, and how to handle people's problem or how to help people. Now, but, you know, he did listen to me. So I chose the right time to, that he would listen to me. If I talked to him right then when he was angry with me, it would not work. But I wait for that moment. And he kept having a good impression of me because he introduced me to other places for ministry. So it was very helpful to me.
but he himself has some problem. And I said to him, I noticed that when you talk to the pastor, you had some anger. I said, have you noticed that? He said, yes. He's always saying this to me, so I got angry. And then I said to him, if you get angry, then what will happen? He might block your way of ministry. And then this ministry is blocked, and then, and then he asked me sometimes online, do you have a place to introduce me? Recently he asked me, when you go to different places, can I go with you? I said, my ministry, I have no funding. <laughs> I cannot pay you. It's better you stay where you are and learn how to do better. So he is not happy with where he was. And he continued to have to look for a new place for ministry. Now he's such a person, but God uses him to guide me, open the way for ministry for me. But I saw that he was affected by anger, the inability to handle problems. There are many people like that. Actually, I tell you, most ministers or people who serve God, the biggest problem is how to handle people's problems. The biggest problem is not in the ability to serve. The biggest problem is how to handle people's problems and how to guide people, how to handle people gently and without giving people bad impressions. And also, how come so many people don't live joyfully? It's because of people. Because of, because they cannot handle problem, they cannot accept people's problem. So what can we do? Handle problem. For, it's different for each person. The best way is to treat them nicely and be kind to them and show your example of kindness and maybe it will change. But in our heart, we feel, I don't want to do it. He mistreated me, how can I treat him nicely? It's unfair. This is a lie. Unfair. Let me tell you. Was, was it fair that Jesus died for us? No. The Bible tells us to suffer for Jesus. Is it fair? It's not fair. The biblical teaching, it's okay to be unfair. God knows your suffering. God will repay you. It's okay. So, in your heart, don't say it's unfair. I want to fight. That's not biblical. That's human. The human way of reacting. So, now for each person, there's different wisdom. Basically, to be nice. For instance, your children, your child doesn't listen. What can you do? You might have to use a different policy. Uh, for instance, for children, it's like this. When they're young, when they always cry to get something, you say, when you cry, I won't give it. Okay, you can keep crying. It's okay, no problem, you cry. I just do my work. You finish crying and you come to me. You talk to me, I will give it to you. You, you follow the rules, I give it to you. But if you cry, I won't listen. So when we have this principle, but we are gentle and firm, and then the child will know that you will not give in. When you say, when you cry, I won't listen, then every time when he cries, you don't listen, then he knows that. That's a rule he has to follow. So for a child, basically, the problem with children and with all people is the problem of the will. He wants something. I want it. I want to buy it. I want that. I want to go there. I want to do this. And then you don't want him to do it. He doesn't like it. Now the same thing for adults. I want to marry that person. I don't want to obey God. I want to do this. Is it true? It's our will. We don't want to follow God. We, we have a selfish will. We want to do our own things. Basically, human problems like this. So when you understand it, then you say, okay, I handle my own will for myself. My will is totally God's will. When God tells me to do something, I'll do it. When God says don't do it, I won't do it. When God says do not be affected by the person, I won't be affected by the person. When the person yells at me, it's no, okay, no problem. It only stays in the air for a split second. That's one word I hope you remember. When people yell at you, the sound will stay in the air for one split second. And we will be gone. You don't think about it, it's gone. You don't have to, when people yell at you, the more you re reply, the more you, they will yell, right? So you just stay quiet. Okay. He said, he said in a very impolite way, do this. Okay, I'll do it. Just be submissive and be gentle. And things will be simpler. For many people, you have to have a policy. To argue with them is no good. 
no good result. Now, actually, handling people's problems is a big, big thing. It takes much more teaching, but the main thing is that you really handle it with a little time. I just talked very briefly about handling emotions, because this is one thing that affects people, emotions. And, you know, the Bible has all kinds of teachings about handling our emotions. For instance, in Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart because it's the wellspring of your life. That your heart is the spring of all life. And Bible verses that um, jealousy or sadness, they hurt the heart and hurt our bones. That the Bible has teachings like this, that we know that negative emotions affect us. But why do people have negative emotions? Because we cannot accept certain things as they are. We cannot accept reality. We cannot accept problems. How do we handle that? It has to change our thinking first. If we change our thinking, then we will not be affected emotionally. How do you change the thinking? Change the thinking according to God's thinking. Now why do people get unhappy? Most of the reason is they don't get what they want. Then we get unhappy, right? You want your husband to be nice to you and he does, he's not nice to you, then we get unhappy. Because the thinking is he should be nice to me. And when he's not nice to me, then we'll be unhappy. So basically we have some demands, some expectation. And when we don't get the expectation, then we become unhappy. So that's what happens to us. Or sometimes just frustration. We want to do something. And it's not done according to our way. Or we don't have time to do it. And then we are rushed. And then we can get frustrated. So the expectation and also frustration. Or uh, we want to do better. We want to uh, perform. And then we fail. Or people say negative things to us. And then we say, they should not say it to, to me. And so we have this expectation that we are not rich. How do we overcome that? How do we overcome this negative thinking? Then we say, it's okay. No one can hurt me. God is for me. If I follow God, He will bless me. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will add to me. So then I believe, no problem. Anything happens to me, no problem. I can overcome it with the power of God. And God will not stop His wonderful plan for me because of some people's problem. Then we will not be affected by situation. I have prepared myself for the worst situation. For instance, I go to some places for mission work. I tell you, in some places, the washroom smells so bad, you have no problem locating it a long distance away. That's how bad in some places. Even here, I don't see this problem because here the toilet is flush. In some places, it doesn't flush. It just fills up. It smells very bad and with flies. But I prepare my heart to say it's okay, to accept it. And then when I smell it, I just, I just bear it and I don't complain. And so in my heart, I accept it. Or one day I think about if I get sick. Now some people get sick and then they complain to God. But if one day I get sick, I say, after Adam sin, all people get sick. If I get sick, it's normal. Or if I have cancer, I pray that I will not have cancer. But if one day if I do, I will say, well, it happens to me. It doesn't, it's not the end of the world. The main thing is I trust in God. And when I'm in pain, I can pray to God for healing. And if God brings healing, I thank God for that. Or there's modern medicine that can take away the pain. Or if I have to die, I'll go to heaven. And even in the pain, if nothing works, I'll just keep praying for the presence of God to bring peace to me. And I know that God will be pleased with that, with my heart of praying to Him. So in the suffering, God will continue to be pleased with me and He will bless me. And I'm prepared for persecution. If one day I have to be persecuted, I say some people, they were beaten in persecution and they don't feel the pain when they pray to God. So that's the best. And the second is uh, that 
If I feel the pain, I pray God that give me healing or strength and that to have the joy of the Lord and the Lord gives that to me. That's great. And the voice is, if I have to die, and then I, I told myself this, I comfort by this, myself with this thought. People cannot suffer for too long and then they will die. Now for some people this sounds terrible, but to me this is comforting because I won't be able to suffer for too long and then I will die and then I go to heaven. <laughs> so I tell myself, the worst scenario is I will suffer in a terrible way. And I also can say, Lord, I submit my spirit to you. Please take my spirit. But I will first glorify God. I will tell these people about Jesus, even though I might be beaten. But I know that every time I'm beaten for that, Jesus will remember. So in my mind, I accept that. I accept people's problem. I accept difficulties in ministry. I accept the fact that many people may not listen to my teaching. Or they listen and they don't obey. They experience the joy. Two weeks later, they might lose it. I accept this. Although I try to help. But I accept the fact that not everyone follows God faithfully. I will try the best to be teaching and guiding. But I accept the reality there is always difficulties. And so when there are difficulties, I don't feel bad. No problem. I just keep working because God is pleased with what I do. If they don't obey, it's their problem. So and when a situation like that happens, I won't get unhappy. I have accepted it. Now I might feel a little unhappy. Why, do, why don't people obey God? But then I say, it's not my responsibility. I should not lose joy because of that. So I praise God. So in all situations, for any kind of negative thinking, I always would say, God must have a way. So I handle it the same way, the five steps of victory. Aware, it's destructive. A biblical principle. And then pray, I, I pray and then choose to obey. And then I say, no matter what happens, it doesn't matter. Or even if I have to lose something, even if I uh, receive some bad treatment, even if people hurt me or whatever it is, or even when I get sick in the mission field, it's okay. So in my heart, I accept any difficulties. So if they happen, I'm not affected. To me, the most important thing is stay in the joy of the Lord, to stay to be joyful and peaceful and with the power of God. Now, I have summarized my teaching like this, very simple way. Do you think you can start to handle it? Now, I use a simple il illustration. You wait for the van here, they have the van here that can transport you somewhere, right? And then when you went to the stop, the van was leaving. You say, well, how? how? I didn't, how come I didn't come one minute earlier and then I would have caught the van? And now the van is gone, oh. And then I would say, it's no use to cry over it. You just take the time to praise the Lord. If I have to be late, then I'll be late. So next time I'll be earlier. So, whatever happens, has happened. We just take it lightly. Then, any problems in life, we can handle it. Do you think you can handle life like that? When you handle life like that, then you will continue to be peaceful and joyful in the Lord and have strength from the Lord. Because the main thing is, when you have no burdens, and you trust in God, then you can have peace. And then you can serve God with power. If we have burdens, we cannot serve God with power. Any question? Now, this teaching of mine, I tell you, I got from a long time of suffering, mistreatment by people, and then I learned this, and I have done it many, many times and it works. It works. Any kind of negative thought or any hurts in the past. Actually, I think for the people who hurt me, I say, actually, those people are more miserable. And I say, it's okay that they hurt me. So we can put down the hurts in the past. Yes? Can you speak loudly? Yes. Um, okay, may I just have a question that I believe it will help uh, maybe some of us, including myself also. Uh, like, how can you advise someone who has done something in the past? Like, that thing has happened already, so it's just that the past is haunting you back. Like, the choices maybe 
that you have made or the decisions that you have made. So how do we help someone like that? Um, maybe get your question. Okay, my question is this. Okay, how do you help someone who is finding it difficult to let the past go? To pass, to let the past go. Yeah, to let the past go. Maybe okay. they have made a decision at that time, or maybe they have, they have made. Yeah, actually, they've been done something in the past that okay. they feel like hey, this thing. Okay. It wasn't wise. Okay. So okay. how do you? Actually, it happens to all of us that we have made foolish decisions in the past. <laughs> and the thing is that God's teaching is that He has a wonderful plan in our life. All the days in our life, He already knew. And He has a provision to help us. So when we made the foolish mistakes in the past, if we repent and not, and not to make the same mistakes again and trust in God, then God can correct the situation and make the best of our life. But sometimes it will not restore to the highest level. For instance, some people marry the wrong person. There is a long time of suffering after that. But the best we can do is to let go of the past and say, forget about that, you know, the past marriage or the hurt. And then if the spouse is still here, we try to be nice to the person. If the person is already left, then we say, okay, I've done something wrong. But the best I can go, do is to let go, forget about the past. That's what said, Paul said. Forget about the past and strive forward to the goal that God has set for me in Christ Jesus. That we forget about the past and just try our best. And God, when we trust in God and follow God, right now, God can correct the things in the past and He can bless us again. But let me tell you, it's true that the more mistakes we make in the past, then we cannot go to the highest level. When we make many mistakes in the past, we cannot go to the highest level. But at least we can go higher than now. The reason is, for instance, somebody, someone lost an opportunity to go for education. Then he lost a lot of opportunities. But he can still try to go back to school when he grows up. And when someone got a bad marriage, then the person will be hurt. When you ha have made a number of wrong decisions in the past, what you can do at least, then you can correct the situation and improve. Now, I'll give you a worse scenario. If someone had made all kinds of mistakes, and his life is messy and lousy and terrible, but on the last year of his life, he prayed and suddenly he saw Jesus, he saw heaven, and he said, all my problem is nothing. When I see Jesus, it's so beautiful, and then I can tell people about Jesus. And then he forget about the past. Maybe he only has one month's time or one day's time, and then tell people about Jesus. Suddenly, in that month or that day, he glorified God to an extent far exceeding his past. So the best thing for us to do is to forget about the past and say, Whatever happened has already happened. There is nothing I can change the past, but I can let go because that is garbage. I don't want to keep chewing on that past. And I, when I think about the past, I learn from the past. It's very important. As I said, when I wash dishes, I think of people who mistreated me when I, or when I mistreated someone, I would think about the past and I have com compassion on the person and I felt sorry for the person and I would say, next time I won't do it again. And I don't want to be affected by people. So whatever mistakes we have made, we can let go. And look at yourself. Are you really in a very, very terrible condition? Now the fact that you can come here, and I can see that you are not starving. You are not in the worst situation. <laughs> Do you think so? I mean, you are not starving. I don't see you very, very thin. Have you seen? I mean, sometimes we see Africans like this, very thin people. Oh, you're not like that. <laughs> but we have problems. But the main thing is, we are bothered by the problems. That's why we don't have strength. But you, if you're not bothered by it, if you say, forget about it, and I have strength from the Lord, the main thing is strength from the Lord, and forget about the problems, handle it. There must be a way to handle it. The main thing is put it down and not to be affected by it and find a way to have strength. And also, we need to improve ourselves too. If you lose jobs one after another, that means maybe we have some 
problems in working, so we improve ourselves. And for myself, whatever I do, I improve. I try to do the best. That way, your life will go better and better. And also, you can ask for God's guidance that you can, what can you do in a difficult situation, in a difficult financial, financial situation of society, what can you do that God can guide you? For some people, maybe you create some jobs, you offer to some people, I can do house cleaning for you, I can do this kind of work for you, I can do computer work for you, I can help you with this and that, and that can create some work for some people. So it's something you can ask God for guidance. Okay? Yes? Okay, just want to ask one more thing. Unless if there is no one who wants to ask. I just have a question that I, I want to ask you. Uh, I just want to hear from you, Pastor. Like, how can, okay, how can, uh, okay, how should I ask? Um, how can you help someone not to enter into like a wrong relationship? Because I heard you mentioning, whether you're saying like, let's say someone has made a mistake of entering into a wrong relationship. So now I'm asking this question like, yeah, you as a pastor, how can you help someone and uh, not to 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 make a uh, uh, wrong choices maybe of entering into a wrong relationship. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Stay in mind. Now, the teaching is very important that we tell people that actually I talked about this yesterday. First Psalm 24 1. The world is in God's. And everything that is in it. So everything is in God's hand. And also Jesus answered to Pontius Pilate. If not for the authority given to you, you have no right to do anything. So everything is in God's hand. When we don't follow God's plan, we will suffer. In John 5, Jesus said to the paralytic, for 38 years healed, He said, Sin no more, lest you, the worst thing will happen to you. So when we don't follow good advice from God, when we don't follow God's word, don't think that you'll find a way in the world that you'll benefit. You'll bring suffering. Some people say, people in the world that don't believe in Jesus, they still do well and have money. They have money, but they have problems in other things. Maybe problems in family and other things, and they don't have eternal life, and they don't have the joy of the Lord. So we don't want to say, those people can do well, I want to be like them. It doesn't work. The best is to follow God's plan. So we need to have this teaching of people. God's plan is the best. If you believe that God is the best and He's in control of everything, then you can trust in God and follow God and that the best thing will happen to you. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Do you believe these words? And if you believe, then don't make the wrong decision now. And ask them, why do you want to make this decision? The person said, well, this man is so wonderful, he's so handsome, and everything, everything I want, and, and then he proposes to me, even though he's not Christian, how can I resist? But the biblical teaching is very clear, you know, that do not mingle with the people of the world, that the believer and the non-believers and non-believers are not worthy to be yoked together. So we, we don't want to be yoked together. So the consequence is a lifelong consequence. There's suffering for the whole lifetime. And so we can advise. Now if the person still want to make the decision, we can suggest, we can encourage, we can pray for the person. The presence of God sometimes changes the person's mind. But when people really want something, it's hard for anyone to change. That's something we have to accept too. They really want to get married. No matter what you say, they still get married. And sometimes maybe they even have sex together. So they, he doesn't want to give up. So people already make bad mistakes. So we want to teach people, anytime we fall into sin, there is always destruction. From the flesh will so, will reap destruction. It's always true. So, okay? But I, I appreciate your questions because it shows that you're thinking and you're trying to help people. So you have the heart to help people. That's very good. Yes? Okay. <coughs> Can you speak louder? Oh, or come up to the front here. I was saying I appreciate the teaching. They are really wonderful. 
I have a question, so rather it's, it's an observation. Because some of, most of the things, majority of the things you have said, okay, come all the way here. I've, I've learned to observe them. I've learned to do them. It's been Say it again, please. A lot of the things you have said to me, I've learned to do them to observe them and follow them. Okay. And then I notice, because we are people, we interact so much, we meet with friends in South Africa. We've made so much, we meet friends, we have family members around. And most of the time, people hurt you, like you're saying, it's people who hurt you, and it's people who are around you, not people who are far away hurt you. Because if I meet with someone outside, they hurt you, it's easy to avoid that one. Mm -hmm. I found out that when you relate with people, and then that's where you get the hurt and all that, most of the time it leads you to isolation. It leads you not to really want to give yourself to people, not to go into them, but to keep yourself. And that way when you keep yourself, it's easy, definitely. It's easy to keep up in prayer. It's easy to, you know, do what will make you happy. So how do you relate that, the teaching you have given, and then with friends and family around? Okay. How much time do I give to them? Okay. Now, this is different for each person. It's, you have to ask God, because uh, some family members you can relate in a friendly way. Some family members, it's very hard to relate in a friendly way because they will always say negative things. So you have to decide. You try to be nice to them. We try to be nice to people. But when people continue to reject us, we, we can still be nice, but we don't have to spend as much time. We don't have the responsibility to say, okay, this family member is not nice to me, but I have to see him every month. We don't have to do that if that's, you know, uh, uh, like, your uh, uh, brother or sister that you're not living together. Now, but if someone you live together, then we learn to relate in a non-accusing way, to accept them and to be nice to them, and not to raise any controversy, and, and, and just always try to be nice. And it, it becomes a testing for us. After the testing, we are more mature. And uh, it's true that, I will tell you, it's true that our real friends will not be sinners who follow sin and, you know, and, and are not repentant. Our real friends will not be people like that. We don't have to make friends with these people. We want to be nice to them. We want to treat them nicely so that we can bring them to Jesus. But we have no responsibility to, be, to treat them as our friends. So we choose our friends. I'm very selective on friends. Even though many people treat me as their friend, but I'm very selective on friends because friends are people I can trust, I can talk with, I can communicate, I can work together. You know, I, you know, we don't have to have many friends, but I do have many friends. But I don't. We don't have to have many friends. We you just you know basically if you have a few good friends, it's very, it's better than many friends. So, but then relatives you have to. Face and we, we just learn to not to be affected and to be nice to them. Sometimes it causes some people to separate from them. Uh, I would say don't separate, don't stop the relationship. But we, we still try to be nice, but we don't have to uh, inter interact that much. It depends on you how much you interact. Okay? Okay, thank you for your questions. And I hope you remember these teachings of mine about living in the love of God. In the mercies of God and enjoying God having the prayer of grace. Remember, this is very important. Always saying, God is loving me, God is blessing me, and also always receive the words of grace from God and always say words of grace to people. And not to be affected by people. Then you'll have feeling yourself good things. And then you'll be enjoying life and have strength from the Lord.